Welcome to Journey to Esquire, the podcast. I'm Jocelyn Hardrick, founder and president of Diversity Access Pipeline, Inc., the company behind this podcast and other great programs like Journey to Esquire Scholarship and Leadership Program, which provides $2,000 cash scholarships to third-year law students and internships to second-year law students, along with leadership training and mentors. And Journey to Esquire, the blog, which provides insightful articles to help navigate you through law school and beyond. Find out more on our website, www.journeytoesquire.com. Hi, this is Jocelyn Hardrick, founder and executive director for Diversity Access Pipeline, Inc., the nonprofit behind Journey to Esquire Scholarship Leadership Program, the blog, and this podcast. Thank you so much for joining us again for another great episode of Journey to Esquire. Today, we're passing the mic to Kristen Norse. Kristen is a partner at Kynes, Markman, and Feldman PA, and she's actually a co-managing partner there. She has decades of experience and practices exclusively in the areas of appellate practice, litigation support, and trial consulting in state and federal courts. She received her JD from Boston University School of Law and her Bachelor's of Arts in English, cum laude, from Boston University College of Arts and Sciences. After law school, she joined Hampton, Stoddard, and Griffin, and Runnels, PA, and later worked with the firm of Harris, Barrett, Mann, and Drew, PA. And after seven years in private practice, she changed gears and became a senior staff attorney to the Honorable Chris Altenberg at the Second District Court of Appeal for Florida. After that position, she joined Kynes, Markman, and Feldman, where she is now, and she's the current chair of the Rules of General Practice and Judicial Administration Committee, and a past chair of the Appellate Practice Section, and a past chair of the Appellate Court Rules Committee. She's also a past president of the Florida Association for Women Lawyers, known as FALL, and the Hillsborough Association for Women Lawyers, known as HALL. She has served on the Florida Bar's Citizen Advisory Council as a lawyer member and on the Special Committee on Gender Bias. She's also a mentor for Starting Right Now and a mother to a law student and a wife to an attorney who works for Bay Area Legal Services. Welcome, Kristen. Thank you for having me. Very excited to do this. Yeah, you you have a house full of lawyers. <laughs> I do. Lawyers I be. do have one now. Yes. It's funny because I didn't think my daughter would necessarily go to law school because, you know, she kind of wanted to be the opposite of me for a while when she was growing up. But yes, it, it will be a full table of lawyers now. That's really interesting. I hear that a lot from lawyers of adult children. They're like, I never want to be a lawyer. You work too hard. You're always gone. You're always stressed. And then they end up going to law school. So Really interesting. Well, let's find out about your journey to Esquire. So what initially made you interested in a career in the law? I don't have an exciting story on that. I really wanted to go into a profession. There were no lawyers or doctors or anything like that in my family, but I wanted a profession where I could help people and then hopefully, you know, also make a comfortable living, which was nice. And so I did not do well in science or math and really wasn't very good at anything medical related. But I loved reading. I loved writing. I loved puzzles and analytical things. And so I I decided that maybe law would, would be the best fit for me. And then I was fortunate enough to actually get into a six-year law program right out of high school that Boston University had was kind of unique. There were a couple other programs like it at the time. I don't think there's any left. And so I I just decided, well, let me give that a try. And it 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 really worked out. And I did love law school. I know that's, you know, that's a little bit nerdy, but the the intellectual challenge of it I really liked. And it was like puzzles and and the things that really uh, appealed to me. Oh, okay, great. I was wondering how you ended up at Boston University. So let's go back a little bit. Around how old were you when you kind of made these decisions that, was this high school pretty much? Pretty much high school. Boston, I decided a little bit earlier, a fun story. I I grew up in Vermont, very small town, and always had that like, got to break out of the small town mold. And my dad took me on a business trip to Boston where I made him run the entire Freedom Trail, start to finish, all loved American history. 
Uh, and so Boston was on my list from the very beginning, no matter what the career was, but the law and, and the opportunity to go to Boston University and get and uh, attend their law school was really a, a wonderful opportunity. Yeah, that's wonderful. I had um, I got into Boston University for undergrad and uh, like three of my good friends went there and I almost went there. Mm -hmm. I decided to stay in New York because it's expensive. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, it is a you know, it's a private school and yes. um, a very well regarded one. Um, right. And I still ended up at a private school, but they gave me a full scholarship. So that kind of made a decision for me in that sense. So um, although you ultimately chose Boston because of the six year program, what was your application cycle like? Did you take the LSAT? Were you looking at a variety of schools or was it kind of like only if they have the same program as Boston? That was unique and interesting because what it was, was when I applied to get into undergrad, I applied to be part of this program. And once you were accepted into the program, then you had to maintain uh, a GPA of a certain level. I don't think it was particularly, it was like 3.2 or something, you know, you, you had to do well in undergraduate. And you had to take the LSAT, but I don't even remember them having like a, a specific score. If so, it was a manageable score that you could get. And I guess they had the program at the time because law school applications were down and they were trying to fill seats. By the time I went to law school, that had changed. So I didn't have to really worry about that separate application process to law school, which I know in hindsight is a, a wonderful thing. And the LSAT, I remember taking and being worried about it, but probably not at the critical level that people are now with how important that test has become. Yes. And then it's interesting because we're back to the point where law school applications are down and law schools are trying <laughs> to figure out, OK, how do we fill our seats? How do we stay open? Particularly right. because a lot less people have gotten their bachelor's degree. So even if you want to attract students, if they don't have a bachelor's, there's not much you can do unless you change right. the rules. So interesting. OK. Yes. And that sounds like a great program. I hope they bring those kinds of programs back. It really uh, was. It really was. Yeah, because I would have I would have done that in a heartbeat. I decided at nine yes. years old to be a lawyer. So I'm like, yes, let's go. Not have to worry about moving again, which is a big mm -hmm. thing that students are doing now. Just completely moving to a new city right. just to go to law school. And I cut out a year, which helped with the finances. You know, that that definitely helped. Um, now, you know, in hindsight, should I have been in such a rush to get out of undergraduate? Maybe not. But it it definitely kept the student loans down. It it got me through. And so that was important. And, and it is important for a lot of students, I think, to be able to get the degree and start working. Yes. And if you're like yourself, first generation student, you feel like you're being guided for six years instead of like four years of like doing this. English degree and then having to figure out this whole other thing, right? you know, yes. so did they let you choose any undergrad major? Or was there a limit to what you can major in? You could choose anything. Um, okay. You know, English was just, you know, something that I knew I would do well at and, and that I was uh, in, interested in. I, at one point I thought about, I took a Russian studies class and I got very interested in that, but you know, there was only so much I could go and do with that. So yeah, Not so unless you plan on traveling. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, because I know someone who had a degree in Russian, but she wanted to be like a translator and work for the Department of State and do those kinds of things. Right. Okay. So you mentioned earlier that you enjoyed law school because it was a lot of puzzles and um, writing and reading. You know, one of the things that surprised me about law school is how much writing there actually is, because whenever law is depicted on, in media, it's talking and being in court. So can you talk a little bit more about like what you did in law school that you enjoyed beyond just the classes? I didn't do a lot beyond law school that I did. <laughs> like mock court, mock trial? Oh, yes. Okay. So I did mock, I did do moot court and I really enjoyed that. And it's funny because I went into law school very shy, very, very shy. I was the person who did not want to raise their hands. And so I was terrified of moot court when I, we had to all do it first year. Everybody had to do one first year. And I just was pretty sure I wasn't going to survive the ordeal. But once I got up and I started talking and I got used to it, I really did enjoy it, including the, the talking side. I always liked the writing and research side, but being able to explain it to a, to a panel of judges and being able to have that back and forth and to work the case up 
you start thinking about a case one way and then the more you talk about it with people and the more you think about it from all the different angles. And so that was really a great experience. And so second year, I got invited to be a director for the first year moot court program where we helped put the first year moot court program together for the one else the next year. I would say my favorite thing that I did in law school was we had a class. Now you do have to remember this was before online dockets, but we had a class called Supreme Court Decision Making and only nine people were invited to the class and it was put on by a former U.S. Supreme Court law clerk. And he was able to get the pending briefs in the U.S. Supreme Court and each class was reviewing all the briefs and acting like a, you know, a pseudo Supreme Court and then writing up opinions. And so I think that's probably where my love of the appellate practice in particular really took hold. That is an excellent course. Wow. And that's, yeah. I was like, nine is a random number, but now it makes sense. <laughs> if you're acting <laughs> like a Supreme Court. Wow. You know, you're a law nerd when you stay up with one of your classmates till 2 a.m. talking about the contracts clause, which I don't think I ever otherwise would have even heard about in law school. Yeah, I teach the contracts clause in my con law class and the students are like, wait, what? But it's become more relevant now because of COVID, right? That that was a national right. emergency that allowed Congress to alter or states to alter pending contracts, which is the right. only time it comes up. Right? <laughs> um, so, you know, as a first generation law student, how did you know about things like law review? Like you said, moot court, everyone had to do it their first year. So that makes right. sense. But things like law review, I remember thinking, what is law review and why does it sound like a big deal? Yeah, I, you know, I think in hindsight, I sort of stumbled around, right, because I didn't have that guidance in the in the contrast between now with my daughter, who does have this wealth of knowledge and who can come to us and say, well, what should I do? And, and where, you know, where should I prioritize my time? It's a huge advantage. And so I, I did kind of learned on, on campus, keeping an eye out, that type of thing. I did, I actually you know, they did the law review competition right after first year, uh, the end of first year, two weeks after, you know, finished your exams. And then they gave you this giant packet. And I really, I hadn't prepared for that adequately in advance. And so um, my mom was very upset when I didn't actually finish the the competition. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> but now, why I was survived. your mom upset? She just understood it was something important. And yes. I, and I didn't, I don't know how she knew actually, now that I think about it, but, um, you know, I, maybe I had told her, oh, it's really important and it, and it's a, it's a big thing. So I was glad that I had the moot core and that was really what I enjoyed doing more. And so that, that worked out because I, I do think it's important to have something, some outlet that shows your interest over and above your classes. Yes, that's true. So I've, I've gotten a lot of inquiries from students now at my law school about, okay, I can't do all of this stuff, professor. Mm -hmm. What is the the most interesting or which one is going to help me the most on my resume and things like that? We just mm -hmm. had our in-school moot court competition and I was talking to a student who went through it and she was so nervous. I said, but you've learned so much just by doing it, yes. right? She's a shy person like you. Right. So I, I just want to encourage our listeners, if you are someone who's in law school or trying to get into law school, and wondering, okay, how will I get all this done? Pick one, <laughs> right? but do something right. outside of class to really challenge yourself and to see if you like it. Cause you never know. There's such pressure now to do it all in law school. And I think then you risk doing it all not well. Whereas if you pick one thing and you really knock it out of the park, you will get the allies you need and professors or lawyers that you interact with. And so it is hard keeping that temperature down when you're in law school and you see that there are people doing four or five different things. But if, you know, really choosing wisely the things that you think you'll be interested in is is really important. Yes. And having mentors that you can ask, right? Just like you said with your daughter, you can help her prioritize. These are the really important things. These are the things you can skip or maybe do later. <laughs> I'm glad that you shared that you didn't actually make it into law review and wasn't able to finish, but you're still very successful. You're still a great <laughs> writer. Sometimes people think, you know, it's the end of the world if I don't get check this box. But in reality, law school is just um, there to get you to the JD. <laughs> Once you get your JD, right. you have all this opportunity to build your experience. 
So I, I, I talked about, you know, your first job, then your next job. How did you find that first job, though? Because when students graduate, it was like, OK, how do I get to my first job? I don't have experience in the law. So, right. you know, where do I start? I had a tough journey there at the start. So when I started law school, the market was booming and they told us, oh, we place 80 percent of our graduates before graduation. You're going to be fine. Average salaries are great. You know, um, and of course, I had been based what I could borrow in student loans on those rosy pictures. And within the three years, it flipped. 20% of graduates were placed by graduation. The median salaries were way down. There were more law firms laying off than hiring. And so I came home to, to Florida and I, I swore during law school that the only things I didn't really want to do were family law and tax. And I came home and I studied for the bar and you had to network to try to find a job. Well, the only lawyers my family knew were family law lawyers because my mom was a social worker. So she and I had this idea that I could go to some of them and offer to do contract work for them. And so I did for a few months, I went around and I offered to do contract work and I expressed my interest in appellate work in particular, if they had any appeals. And I got some contract work doing appellate work and doing some revamping of forms and working in the family law area. And then that turned into a job offer. So my first job was all almost exclusively family law, which I actually did enjoy in ways that I didn't realize that I would and had some affinity for. And I got, when they hired, they said, well, we know you don't really want to do family law, which I probably shouldn't have shared, to be honest. But they said, any appeals that we do get, we'll, we'll have you work on those. So I, I got to do some appeals during that first position. And then I just got to really spread my wings in a small firm where I literally was handed cases and, you know, here's, here's how to get to court. Uh, so kind of sink or swim thrown into the mix, which really was a great experience because it taught me that I could do anything like that. The wonderful thing about being a lawyer is there are so many different areas of law. If you don't like one area, there's another. There's so many facets of each area in and of itself. And once you know that you can read the law, bone up on it, contact your resources, get the information you need, you can practice in pretty much any of them. Now, some of them are going to take more effort than others, but with the right connections, with the right mentors, with the right stick to itiveness or perseverance, you know, you can figure it out. You can go to court and try that hearing and and uh, find success. So that was really the first year was extremely stressful. I remember, you know, really just feeling totally overwhelmed. And then the second year, it's like, OK, I, I've got some of this under control. I kind of know what I'm doing and it gets you know better from there as you go along. Yeah, that's a great message because we're back to that again, right? Where yeah. <laughs> the the firms aren't hiring as much, the median salaries are down, students are having to do what you did, get creative, right. offer their services to get experience and to earn income because you have to pay off your debts, you know, pretty soon after right. you graduate, pay, repayment starts. Yes. And I'm I'm glad you shared that, that you got creative because that's what students just really have to do. Especially students, again, first generation, don't have any contacts. They didn't have the, the kind of grades and credentials that gets them into big law firms that are typically hiring. Smaller law firms tend to want people with more experience because you have to be able to work on your, on your own a lot. And right. so it does require some perseverance and patience. And so that's a nice segue into what advice do you have for current law students or people thinking of the law or even recent grads who are graduating and trying to figure out what the next step is? So I think that's that's it. Be flexible. I didn't think I would like family law, but I did. And I, I had found some success in it. And it did help me eventually work to where I thought I wanted to be and, and did want to be, I guess, in, in appellate practice. And just keep an eye that you can keep growing those experiences. The other thing is just, you know, I think intellectual curiosity goes a long way. So you're given a new topic and just like immerse yourself in it and figure it out and then offer your services. And then that's the other thing I think I didn't appreciate enough when I was younger as a first generation lawyer. I didn't want to bother people. I would think, you know, oh, well, I don't want to go, you know, call up judge so-and-so who I met at the hall luncheon, because that'll be 
you know, I'll be interfering in their life or interrupting their very busy time. And there were people who offered like, oh, call me anytime. And I was hesitant to do that. But I can tell you being on this side now that I say that to people. And, you know, the worst thing that would ever have happened was that somebody would say, well, no, I'm busy right now. And maybe they would have called back or maybe they wouldn't have. But there are so many lawyers out there who are willing to answer those calls, give you some advice. You're thinking about a new area or you're interested in, you know, a certain type of law and, you know, sometimes even just cold calling. If you can find a connection, great, but sometimes just cold calling. Oh, I saw you're with this firm and that you practice this area of law. And it's maybe this seems weird, but I'm a law student and I'm really interested. Could I, you know, take you out to lunch or meet you for coffee and and hear a little bit about your practice? Those contacts really help. I think the other advice is like treat everybody with respect because you never know who's going to be that that connection that you need. You know, the certainly the judicial assistants got to be on their good side. But your staff, the the other people that work in your office, the people who clean your office, the, the people you run into when you're uh you know running errands. Being a lawyer kind of takes a village. And so having all these contacts and people around you can really be a, a benefit to you in your career. And, and in surprising ways, even people who aren't lawyers can really help you as you as you grow your career. I think the other thing that I didn't, I mean, I'd like to give advice on the things that I don't think I did correctly. The economics of law practice, you don't learn that in law school. You, you don't really understand what is valued in the law firm. And so I think when you start to work, you need to pay attention to that. What is valued in this law firm? Is bar service valued? Is it the billable hour? How many billable hours? Is it the quality of the work? And is it building a book of business? One of the things that I think I did not appreciate coming out of law school is how important a book of business is in the legal world. Um, So having clients that are loyal to you, and you have to work as a team too. So you don't want to be this person who hogs up all the clients, but being the kind of person that is a resource that people will come to gives you a lot of freedom in where you want to work. If you know, you will be able to bring clients with you. Yeah. Those are all very great points. I tell my students all the time because I teach criminal law and constitutional law and legislation. They're like, I don't want to do any of this stuff, right? I want to go into... (laughs) civil trial and this, that, and then they do criminal law and they love it, right? Or right. they thought they would love it and then they do and they're like, this is not for me at all. Um, so definitely remain open and flexible. And, yes. you know, that's why Journey to Esquire started. That issue you talked about, students feeling too shy yes. to reach out because there's such an abundance, especially in Tampa Bay where we mm-hmm. practice, but students just get intimidated. And so we are like kind of the connection between, you know, the judge and the lawyer and the students and say, listen, this is a safe space. It's okay. They volunteered (laughs) with us. That means they want you to call them. So keep that in mind, you know, reach out. The worst that can happen is you don't hear back, right? Most people do want to help though. They really do. They They really do. I, I mean, I, and I have seen that through my whole career. I always, when I've, so I start in a small firm and there's only so many times you can walk into the partner's office and ask her these questions. And, and so finding, you know, in particular through voluntary bar service and the Hillsborough Association for Women Lawyers, I would uh, sign up for those luncheons and go to the luncheon and then gather up all my little questions about the politics of law and dealing with this judge or how am I going to handle this motion and build this sort of, you know, group around me who could, supplement for the times that I didn't want to ask that my partner <laughs> for the fifth time. Yes, that that now that can get very real, right? Because your, your partners <laughs> want to help you. The senior associates and other people in the firm who've been there a while want to help you, but they also have the same billable hour <laughs> requirement that you do. So they have to be careful. So you mentioned Hall a couple of times as the Hillsborough Association of Women Lawyers and Fall, the Florida chapter of the larger organization that un- Hall falls under. And they do great work. They really help support women in the law. And although women outnumber men in law schools, we know, we've seen the statistics, that once you get into law firms, once you get into judicial races and judicial positions and positions of power, really, there's still a lot less women than men represented. And there's a lot of reasons for that. 
Um, so tell us a little more about Hall and Fall, the service they provide, and, and what it was like for you to be president of those organizations. So I joined, luckily, the first job that I worked at, the partner that I worked with was Eileen Griffin, and she was a member of Hall, and she just came in one day and was like, we're going to a Hall luncheon, and you should join, and, you know, the firm will take care of it. And so that was kind of my entr entrance into Hall. And so once a month, we'd have these programs and we'd go and, and listen and I'd get a chance to meet in a really kind of a safe space, other women lawyers and hear about their practices and their struggles in the law and in balancing work and family. And, and so I really enjoyed it and I enjoyed it sort of just as a participant for a while. And then one day Judge Scriven was the president of Hall and she had a, a program on what should Hall be, you know? And I don't know if he was, I, to this day, I think maybe this was a plant, but there was a man in the audience. And at one point he got up and said something along the lines of, well, this will never be more than a ladies lunch club. And uh, <laughs> boy, that did that set me off. So uh, at the end, Judge Griffin had given a pitch like, hey, we really want people to be involved. We want to, you know, bring Hall to the next level. And so that was it. I, I called the next day and I was like, I, I don't know what that guy thinks, but I am ready to do whatever you want to do to continue to grow the organization. And so she really got me involved by making that ask. And I think that's so important too. I try to remember that too. A lot of the things that I've done, I've actually done because somebody asked me, not because I thought of it myself. <laughs> So, and I think we're prone to that sometimes as, uh, especially younger lawyers. Um, so I became involved at the board level and started to do some of the programs that they had. We, we would do a paint your heart out day where you'd go and help uh, rehab homes of people. Uh, we would do a lot of work with um, the local shelters and, and things like that. And it just gives an, a, a perspective of, uh, being able to help the community at large, but also to make these connections locally. And so it's, a you know, these are my referral source people. These are my people to call when I have a problem, you know, really got some strong connections out of it. And uh, so then after I'd be, been the president of Hall, I decided, well, I'd spend some time working with the fall board at the statewide level. And then again, you'd think I'd have learned at this point, but I was working on the board for a number of years, doing different things at the statewide level. And then Brittany Maxey said to me, you know, you really should be the president of fall. So that put me on the path to becoming the president of fall. And I, you know, I, I believe so much in what they work for and they, they do also try to work across with other voluntary bar associations, other minority bar associations, because there is, there's still differences in the law. I would let, you know, I think when I started at Hall in the 1990s and, oh, we've come so far and and maybe we'll just, uh, you know, over time, it, there won't be a need for this. And so I, I'm still kind of sad 30 years later, I can't tell you that that's actually the case, but there are different challenges that we face based on our backgrounds, based on some of the affinities that we have. And so having those spaces to talk about that, to explore it, to raise awareness in the in the broader community of lawyers. And I think, you know, we have done, I think I'm really happy about, you know, the lactation rooms that have been created, the increases in parental leave policies and things like that. I mean, we are, I think, slowly getting there, but I do think there's still a, a spot for halls and falls and jibas and, and these organizations that help us overcome what other people don't really even understand their obstacles. Yeah, that's so true. And, uh, you know, talking to young students now and new lawyers, I'm still hearing the, they thought I was a court reporter. And we're like, really? With all the women lawyers that are there now, I come in with the suit and the file and I sit at a council table. You still thought I was the court reporter. So yeah, you have a ways to go in terms of the attitudes of the people currently who are lawyers and judges so that it is more inclusive for women. They need to really start assuming that the women who walk in are the lawyers and then let them correct you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we're not there yet, but we're still working on it. 
And like you said, the lactation rooms and the parental leave is recognizing that people are going to be parents. And even the women who still are primarily the caretakers still want to be able to do both because the law is not one of those professions that you can just disappear for five years and hop right back in. <laughs> That's not, that hasn't been. Um, not easy. <laughs> yeah, it hasn't you been. You can, <laughs> but it's hard. Yeah. Yes, it's very hard, but it's, there is a there is a penalty for people who do yes. that. I took a year off and and you know worried about it. Right. But it's great to hear that Hall and Fall and or other organizations are still here, and that women like yourself who were there in the '90s, like you said, in the thousands, <laughs> are still supporting law students and recent grads and making sure they understand that the work is being done. We're going to keep doing it. And we still have your back. So, That's right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Kristen, for joining the Journey to Esquire podcast. We're looking forward to working with you more in the Journey to Esquire. And I just want to let our audience know we will see you next time. Thank you for all the work you do. I know how much it means to the students. So appreciate it. Thanks for tuning in to another great episode of Journey to Esquire, the podcast. Support, share, subscribe. And for more, visit www.journeytoesquire.com.